Paul, how did you come to make a film uh, of this kind? Well, what, what, what were you thinking you went into making Dog Eat Dog? I didn't mean to uh, do a film like this. I had been involved in a situation with Nick Cage, a very painful one, where we did a film and it was taken away from me, and uh, we disowned it. And I said to Nick, you know, if we live long enough, we should work together again and remove this stain uh, from our clothes, really my clothes. And, um, and he said, yes, yeah, certainly. So I was sort of looking for something I might do with him. And I came across this script, and I read that opening sequence, which was kind of outrageous. And I thought, maybe, you know, Nick would want to do this. I sent it to him, and he said, yeah, I, I want to do it, but I just played a crazy person, so I'll, I'll play the straight person. <laughs> and then, now I'm making a crime film. I'm not a crime film director. Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, how do you make a crime film in 2016? After Scorsese, after Tarantino, after Guy Ritchie. Uh, and so that was sort of the challenge of what does a crime film look like today? And uh, this was the answer. Well, so how did you how did you find that? Um, how did you find your mojo on this? What what, what was your guiding well, initiative? Well, I uh, I've put together a young team. I was looking for. You know, there was a generation that made the rules and a generation that codified the rules, a generation that broke the rules, mine, a generation that laughed at the rules, Quentin's, and now there's a generation that doesn't know there were rules. And that's who I was looking for, and so I put together this group, and they had come from other fields, uh, video games and documentaries and fashion. And, you know, I, the moment someone says, um, let's think outside the box, that means they're already in the box. And I was looking for young people who, didn't, who couldn't find the box if you asked them. <laughs> and so that's, we, we created this sort of group. And, uh, and we just, I just said to them, you know, the, uh, the bad news is we don't have enough money to do it uh, the way it should be done. The good news is I have final cut and we can make any movie we want. And there's nothing we can't do. And you know, that became sort of the impetus. And the end result is, <laughs> a film more about crime films than it is about criminals, in fact. <laughs> um, but that, that was, you know, and, uh, it, you know, the script wasn't a comedy, but uh, the more I got into it, I said, you know, this, this, this shit is funny, <laughs> and these guys are dumb. And, um, and so I kept going that direction. And then, uh, then, you know, lo and behold, it ends up in the afterlife, which wasn't planned either. Was that not in the script? No, no, the whole Bogart thing was not in the script. And uh, uh, Nick had sort of fashioned his character on uh, a guy who liked Humphrey Bogart. And I, I wasn't that crazy about that. But I wasn't going to pick a fight with him. I could cut, I cut it out in, in, in the editing. And, and then we talked about the ending. And he said, I don't get this ending. Me and the black couple, why? How did I ever escape? Uh, what's that whole ending about? Uh, you know, why am I still alive? I said, well, maybe you're not. Maybe it's an afterlife sequence. And uh, so when we came to do it, we were reading through before shooting on that night, and now he's reading the whole thing as Humphrey Bogart. I go, oh, wow. Hey, you know, Nick, this is, uh, you know, we, we can't afford to do this two different ways. If you're going to do this as Bogart, we're going to be kind of stuck with that. <laughs> and he said, well, you said maybe he was dead. And if he's dead, he gets to be Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, and he said, you know, you've been telling me for five weeks everything about this film should be bold. And I think this is a bold choice. And I said, I think you're right, Nick. And uh, we went out and shot it that way. Well, can we talk a bit about Nick Cage? What kind of actor is he to work with? Is it, do we have a perception of him. How is he for you? And what Nick is, um, uh, as a professional, highly responsible, highly uh, prepared. He likes you to believe the opposite, but it's not true. Uh, of course, as a, um, as a financial entity, he is... He is 
not quite as responsible. <laughs> but as an actor, he is, uh, he is very, very responsible and very prepared. And, and, and he'll, he'll do things from time to time that you think are spontaneous and kind of crazy. And then you retrace it in your mind and you realize that he's been working on this for, for days or perhaps even weeks. Uh -huh. You know, like that thing where he spontaneously uh, kisses the, the, the nurse or something, the uh, uh, nanny, and he just, he just did that. And then afterwards I was thinking about it and I realized, oh, he's been playing that for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> And also, you have um, Willem Dafoe. Did, did you work them to be? You work with Willem on Light Sleeper, I think. Did, did yeah, we ever, worked like, a, a number of times. The last time I worked with Willem, it was just a day roll, and afterward he said, "You know, don't ask me again, because uh, you know I was happy to do this for you as a favor. But if you're gonna, if we're gonna work together again, you have to give me a real role, not not this kind of day roll bullshit." And um, and so when Nick passed on the best role, Mad Dog, I was able to go to Willem and say, I've got a real role for you now. <laughs> and we were able to balance out the film uh, so that it didn't appear just to be another Nick Cage film. We gave Willem the whole opening, gave him the 10 minutes at the end. And then uh, it was just a matter of, um, you know, the good thing about doing a film with Nick Cage is you get your film made. The bad thing is he eats up your budget. And so then you have to find a way to pay other people. Because you know, Nick is just sort of the monster who ate your budget. And so I, I finally had to get Nick to give some money to Willem. You know, and so that Willem could, could say, OK, OK. You know, my, my pride is satisfied now. This sounds like a good time to go to audience questions. Does anybody have a question for Paul? Well, I mean, he was not from films. Uh, this is his first film credit, so he didn't bring a lot of baggage. And uh, and basically, we because they were all young, and because this was their first big credit, we had a whole summer, and we met every week at a coffee shop in New York, and we just threw ideas around. And you know, what if? Well, you know, let's do something di different. What if we do that? And so that was the environment, uh, and. Uh, the Pink Room came out, and we were talking about a film called Belly from the 90s, a black film, which has a, a pink room and a blue room, and so that would be a good idea. Let's do that. And the, um, and the black and white sequence, that came about because we were all talking, and I said, oh, strip club sequence, boring. Every strip club sequence looks the same, the same red and blue backlights and the same fog and the same cuts. How in God's name do you do a strip scene, strip club scene that looks any way fresh? And then the, we were thinking and I thought, wait a second, I haven't seen a black and white strip club scene since Lenny. Maybe we just do it in black and white. Don't tell the audience why, just do it. And um, they'll be so interested in figuring out, try to figure out why this is in black and white, they won't be bored. <laughs> And that was the only reason we did it in black and white. <laughs> no, I've never met Ed Bunker. Uh, Willem had done a film with Ed uh, from one of Bunker's novels. Bunker was kind of like the real deal. He was a man who spent quite a bit of his life in prison. And he really wrote books from inside the criminal mind. The... Um, theme of every one of his books was once you're in the criminal life, you can never get out. He, of course, was the exception to his own theme because he did get out. But this is, in fact, not a very faithful adaptation of Ed Bunker. That was not my goal. Ed Bunker's sensibility was forged in the 60s and 70s. This book was set in the 90s. And I was trying to make a film that felt like 2016. And I knew that if I was faithful to Ed Bunker, it wouldn't feel like 216. So uh, in, in fact, being faithful to Edward Bunker was uh, down the list of priority. How desperation. 
<laughs> I, um, I didn't want to. Uh, I had asked Quentin, I had asked uh, if Scorsese was going to do it, then it turned out to be his birthday, and I had asked Nolte and uh, uh, a bunch of people. I even asked Rupert Everett to do it as a uh, uh, transgender Cleveland gangster. <laughs> and, and Rup was keen to do it, but then the Oscar Wilde thing came in and, and, and uh, conflicted. And so but we're getting to the end of the film, and uh, I realized we were out of money, and that even if I could get one of these guys, I couldn't even pay for their airfare. And I was the last one they could afford, $900 for three scenes. And uh, you know, Cage was always pressuring me. He said, you should do it. You should just do it. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, uh, I may be bad, but I won't be boring, so I should do it. And um, unfortunately, the day we shot it, I had a fever, as I do now, and laryngitis, as I don't have now. And so the whole process of becoming an actor was just a kind of a blur, just saying, how do I get through this day? And so I don't remember much about that day. I've got more myself, actually, which is, um, were you ever shocked by the things that... Uh, was there any improvisation that shocked you? Because you have this... this well, I mean, as it became more and more of a comedy, and this whole kind of post-rules generation, uh, where you can do anything. Uh, you know, and I first realized this when watching a film called uh, Beautiful Creatures by Xavier Dolan, where he would have a Godard scene, and then a Bertolucci scene, then a Cassavetti scene, then a Tal novella scene. I said, you know, he's 19 years old. He, he, he said, I said to myself, he doesn't know you can't do that. And the truth is, you, you can. You, you can put anything together now. There are no rules like that. There isn't, the whole concept of unified style doesn't necessarily apply anymore. So, you know, we're thinking this way, and then, uh, and so one scene I thought I'd do like Orson Welles, one scene I do like Michael Bay, another scene I do like Mr. Robot, uh, and another scene I do like Alma DeVar. And, uh, and so we're doing, we're rehearsing this Orson Welles thing, and the, the, the funniest line is Nick is saying, well, you know, where's that thing you put in the baby's mouth? He's improving this. And Willem says, you mean the dick? And then, all of a sudden he goes, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. That's so awful. But by this time we were both laughing. <laughs> so it ended up in the movie. <laughs>